Well, good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon, friends. How are you doing today? Hopefully you are uh, having a, a great day wherever you are and uh, the weather is cooperating. And uh, uh, over here in um, Sherwood Park, Alberta, it's actually a pretty um, nice day, sunny day, a little cooler. But uh, uh, we have a, a guest, a wonderful guest today joining us all the way from South Africa. Just, just uh, I think he said, uh, just near Johannesburg, Johannesburg there. And uh, we have... Uh, uh, a wonderful guest that's going to talk about uh, all kinds of things uh, and uh, wonderful um, fun things, uh, technical things, uh, privacy things, and, and all things that really matter in, in the age that we live in. Uh, we have Ross Saunders joining us. Uh, on Conversations with Dune and Friends. And so let me just do a, a quick introduction of uh, Ross's background so that you uh, have a sense of uh, who you'll be hearing from for the next hour and a bit here. Ross, can you still hear in the green room? Uh, hear me in the green room there, my friend? Wonderful, wonderful. So Ross started out uh, as a paper boy in 1999, perhaps uh, subconsciously influenced by the video game of the same title. Now his skills improve with practice, both at video games and, and real life. Uh, and his love for games saw him moved into the field of IT, uh, information technology. Uh, he then moved uh, through a, a range of technical positions with uh, a brief dalliance in uh, software development. Since then, Ross has uh, spent numerous years uh, in strategic management for um, a multitude of uh, multinational uh, software companies, uh, culminating in uh, starting his own uh, consultancy in, in information security and privacy. Now, Ross is a firm believer in the phrase, uh, life is as interesting as you make it. Uh, and he strives to uh, try new things uh, whenever possible. Uh, the journey so far has been an interesting one and it shows no sign of uh, slowing down. As a self-proclaimed perpetual student, uh, Ross believes uh, in the constant learning coupled with the uh, sharing uh, that knowledge, uh, something that has sparked his love for professional speaking. Ross has since spoken in, in four continents and, and uh, sharing the knowledge of, of technical subjects as well as uh, how people can protect themselves in the digital world. Friends, please help me in welcoming our wonderful guest today, Ross. Saunders, how are you doing today, Russ? Uh, hope you are well, my friend. Probably a little warmer where you are. I am very well. It is it is it is toasty where I am. So we're we're in the evening and we're at 30, 33 degrees already in my my study that I'm sitting in right now. Thirty three degrees and and sort of in the evening. So so you are about seven eight hours ahead of where I am today and. Uh, uh, so you're in the evening there. Uh, tell us a bit more. Uh, what got? What else got you here? Um, uh, I mean, the bio shares some uh, some parts of that, but uh, tell us the backstory of um, uh, you know your journey so far, my friend. And uh, wow, it's 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 been quite the journey, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not actually sure where to start. I've had so many things that have kind of led me up to the point that I'm I'm at mm -hmm. now. I I think let me go with the the privacy slant because that's where I, I think I've really Blossom, blossomed with speaking and yep. all of that. And that, that came from a bit of a, a challenge, as I suppose many things do, mm -hmm. in that back in 2013, my identity was stolen. And oh, no. that, that kind of gets you into a real space of, of caring about privacy, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily care about privacy as much as they should. And, and there, there's a distinct value to your in information that you have. Mm -hmm. And having my identity stolen really opened my eyes to that and, and, and showed me this world of identity theft and what can go wrong and what does go wrong and how to get your credit records back and things like that. Uh, the amount of laptops and things that I bought that I never actually purchased is just astounding. So laptops, mobile phones, Wow. Furniture sets, you name it, 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 it ended up being purchased. So that, that was about a two year process of repairing the credit record and canceling all the credits and, and things like that and, and in, getting insurance and, and so on, which really sparked the interest then in, in where I am now. And a lot of that speaking came from that because, you know, 
I don't want anyone going through what I went through. So the idea is that I want to teach people about the importance of privacy and security. You bet. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. And you're right. It's always, uh, you know, a significant event that that changes uh, often the trajectory of, of our life's uh, work and, and of our focus and whatnot. And in your case, it was, uh, I'm sure, a very painful one at that, a very painful <laughs> one. And uh, like you said, you know, span over uh, many months, a couple of years or something like that. It doesn't get sort of all dealt with and cleaned up right away. And, and you know, you kind of forget about it the next week. Uh, it kind of lingers on is what I'm hearing. Yeah, and I, I was one of the lucky ones. Um, I didn't get any fraud on my passport or marriage certificates, things like that. There's folks who end up being married off without knowing it. And <laughs> oh, wow. Folks who have passports changed and people lose businesses um, due to identity theft where someone can sign the business away that it, it was a director. So wow. Quite crazy stuff that can happen. I, I was definitely a lucky one and, and mine still took two years to repair. Yeah, wow. That's uh, you know, it's a topic that now many of us don't give a lot of thoughts to, and for sure, until it happens to us, I suppose, and um, or hear a really compelling story from uh, a great speaker like yourself. So, so uh, we met over, uh, I think it was in Vancouver that we met. Was that right? Yeah, it was Vancouver. Yeah, yeah Vancouver. Uh, I forgot which year it was, but it was uh, a wonderful, uh, again, as always, uh, annual convention of the CAPS, uh, Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. Now, you live in South Africa, but uh, being uh, you know, the, the president of the uh, speaking uh, professional speaking uh, uh, organization there, which is affiliated with uh, what's called Global Speakers Federation and whatnot, of which uh, CAPS also is a member, you, um, you came to Canada a few times and, and really... Uh, uh, I'm going to say become an honorary uh, Canadian. <laughs> uh, you and your wife uh, enjoyed uh, your visits here, and we enjoyed your visit with us. Very much so. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was 2018 that we met. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the last number of years, and, and I, I, I'm now the, the former president of PSASA. Uh, mm -hmm. My term ended in March this year. Mm -hmm. But it, it's been fantastic. It, one of the things I wanted to do when I was in the PSASA was go and meet the different people at these different associations. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that you don't get anywhere by yourself as well. So yes, mm -hmm. there is live life to the fullest and try everything, but but you've got to do it with people's help too. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the associations. The associations did wonder, wonders for me. And with that Global Speakers Federation link, coming to Canada was fantastic. And, and I've, I've actually since joined CAPS as, as a dual member because of the amount of time that we yeah, spent you there. Bet. You bet. So and I'm, in I'm fact, part of BC. <laughs> there you go. You know, you, you tell us, uh, again, you, you went uh, with an acronym there. For our viewers who may not know uh, PSASA, tell, you know, spell it out for yeah. us. Yeah, so th that's the Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa. And some of our, our UK friends do call it the PSASA, SASA, SASA, because of the <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's wonderful. You know, isn't it great that we live at an age, love it or hate it, technology has given us the option to connect over vast, you know, continents and, and different continents and all of that. That, that. that is, I find that wonderful. Oh, I, I love it too. Uh, the, the global village is, is quite small, actually, and, and mm -hmm. you, you get to do that and, and get to meet them like we're meeting now. Yeah, but, but as Spider-Man's uncle says, you know, with great power comes great <laughs> responsibility. So, so we have to be responsible Absolutely. on how we, we navigate this, this wonderful technology, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no, that's for sure. Yeah, so, so tell us a bit more how you got into IT, uh, you know, I, the bio that I went through earlier said you kind of inspired by, you know, kind of um, media inspired by uh, uh, things like that. But but tell us, uh, when did you get into IT and, and uh, maybe tell us the story behind that? Yeah, well, I mean, I started in IT very young, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I, I could probably hazard from about six years old, um, <laughs> my my cousins that I grew up with who are a, a fair deal older than me, uh, but we're basically brothers. Mm -hmm. They my the the eldest was uh, I if I recall lecturing at university and he he would teach me little bits and pieces uh, on the computer at home and how to launch games and and things like that. So from six years old, I was working in DOS and, and launching stuff. And 
I mean, it, it, when I got to probably more around 12, 13, 14, they started showing me a little bit about programming and Turbo Pascal and, and things like that. But I, I think I've pretty much always been the IT geek that between all the friends and uh, when I was still in school, when I was 16, I had a motorcycle and I could get around. So I started my own little company repairing all the little businesses around where I lived, computers. And that's really where it, it formed. And it just it snowballed from there, I guess. I mean, I was still in high school and I, I was running my own thing after hours. And it was it was a, a real love for it. And gaming came, in, came into it quite a bit as well in that we would do LANs, a bunch of friends of ours. And we'd pack up computers, go to each other's houses, and then spend Friday through Sunday like oh. barely sleeping and surviving on Red Bull and just playing games the whole time. But that, that's pretty much where, where it came from. And, and just it, it really straight out of school, I went straight into working, and it was all IT all the way. Yeah. That brings back so many memories. Uh, <laughs> uh, my IT career actually started when I was still in grade 10. I was paid to program software when I was still in grade 10. And you're right, those wonderful memories of uh, playing with computers and, and learning about computers and, and learning programming software and, and be able to, uh, again, do that with your friends. And, and there's an excitement that goes around you know, just being around technology. And, and the idea, I remember we had to solder and actually make up uh, uh, the, the 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 cable that would essentially connect two computers <laughs> together, right? The the null molding, yeah. they call it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah, one learning of how to solder a twenty-five pin connector. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And uh, you know, these this day and age, a lot of people work with IT in some capacity, whether they work right in the the technical capacity or where they work at a as a subject matter expert. They work. At, uh, face it, we, we live in with a quote unquote information age. So, so you know, IT is an important part of organizations and and of our community and, and life and whatnot. And and so it's not unusual to to meet somebody and say, you know, that they work with IT in some capacity. Now, in your case, you started with uh, what sounds like more technical uh, aspects of IT early on, and then over time evolved, just like uh, my career has as well. Over time evolve yeah. into more kind of uh, the softer things, the more social things, the more uh, corporate things. Uh, Describe uh, to us how, how that happened as a, a technical person, how you evolve into uh, what you are today. Yeah, it, it, it's been quite the journey. Um, you know, I, I went into the technical space. I left school. I didn't go to university straight away and mm -hmm. went straight into working in tech and, and uh, as a technician and then on the call desk, things like that. But yeah, the call desk is a hard place to be, and I have endless um patience for folks that are on a call desk because no one ever phones a help desk to co to say how good the service is everyone phones a help desk to say what's wrong mm -hmm. so it's, it's a high stress role and you know with that high stress i didn't want to be on the call desk all the time mm -hmm. so i decided to study programming because that just you know i did a bit of it in school and i, I really felt you could create things so so i went and studied programming for a year i did java and when I was in college studying Java, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was amazing because you could create all these things in your mind and what have you. And when I went into the corporate world, I found it was quite the opposite because now you've got to maintain someone else's code, <laughs> which ended up not being as enjoyable as I was hoping for it to be. And that mm -hmm. was, I think, where, you know, you I'm sitting, suddenly sitting there that, you know, I love technical. I really enjoyed programming. But now where am I? What am I doing? And that was round about the time, and it probably wasn't known as this by then, but DevOps was starting to be a thing and the cloud was starting to be a thing. And I moved into the space of looking after the technical side, but having to know code as well, which was the perfect space for me, I think. And I, I ended up fixing little bits of code here, but still maintaining the technical server infrastructure here. And it was great fun. And that then progressed into management roles at that company. I, I worked for a company that it, it was just a uh, fantastic Cura. And they looked after everyone and they, they encouraged growth and things like that. So I grew with that company from sort of that little DevOps role to heading up that team to support management for the region and then ultimately into management for support and technical services globally, which was a 
phenomenal growth in the career. And, and from there, it's, it's been more in the management space, looking after teams, both from development side, technical side, and so on. Um, and that, that, that was the space in corporate. Um, but yeah, then you have the move out of corporate, I suppose, and that, that's where I'm sitting now. Yeah. Great time for me to bring in your website and tell us that about the evolution of your entrepreneurship, evolution of your being on your own. And uh, uh, I love the website, by the way. It looks great. <laughs> uh, let me uh, take my uh, video out so we can feature it more here, my friend. Tell us a bit more. Okay. Uh, so, you know, working in the corporate space, I worked mostly with startups in software. That, that's been my happy place, has been always working with startups more than huge corporate, mm -hmm. uh, though have been there too and enjoyed that. But something I saw there and, you know, while I was working, the, the last part of my corporate career was spent in infosec committees and information security and, and that side of things. And I started realizing that small businesses don't get taken care of really when it comes to privacy, when it comes to cybersecurity. It's a very expensive space and there's there's a lot of players in the enterprise league, but when it comes to a small business, there's not so much. And then when you have a small business, you don't necessarily have a chief information security officer or a chief information officer or a chief technical officer. You've got a bunch of guys, girls that are trying to put out fires and run a startup business. So where my consulting sort of came in was to see, well, there must be some way of servicing this market. So the outsourced CISO kind of came into it there. And that's how we basically fulfill that role of a CISO for a small business and then also have a bunch of partners and, and a network of different kinds of businesses that can assist. So I have a, a number of lawyers and attorneys that we can use if, if a company needs some sort of legal advisory. I advise on privacy predominantly and, and information security, but if there's testing that needs to be done third party, we've got a network there. And, and that's very much the space I've been playing in since leaving. And a large, large portion of that has been training and education and awareness of companies because that, that's pretty much where it starts. People aren't aware that they need to look after privacy, that they need to look after information security because most people think that that's the domain of an enterprise, that the banks are getting attacked, not me, but mm -hmm. it happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, so folks, uh, if you wanted to uh, check out more of uh, what Ross um, is up to, uh, his website, one of his website is uh, rosssaunders.com. So his first name, last name, dot com. Ross G Saunders .com. Ross don't, G don't forget the G. There, there you go. Make sure you add the G. Well, G is for, well, is, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so let me just. Um, it's, for, it's for Gary. So it's, it's fine. <laughs> there you go. Um, let me just uh, put it there, Ross. G Saunders, actually, uh, let me uh, do that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, uh, you are you wrote a book, is that right? Correct. Yeah, that, that uh, something inspired from it, it was a passion project inspired from my last stint in corporate. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I was in charge of when I was leaving it was the thing I was doing most was hiring. Mm -hmm. and bringing people up into management roles as as well as hiring juniors. And during that time, we were interviewing, oh, I think we took it down, we took down the metrics and I think we did over 400 interviews in one year. Mm -hmm. So you're doing multiple interviews per day and still trying to get everything done in between. And out of that whole space where we did 392 interviews, we hired four people. Mm. And that was because there's certain skill sets that weren't taught. And, and one of the roles that we really battled with was management because we needed technical specialists to be in management and we tried to promote and then there weren't certain skills. And there's all these university academic kind of things to get someone upskilled, but there was nothing really practical. And that was very much my route that I took. I mean, I was the technical specialist. I did development, networking, all of that, and then suddenly got moved into this regional management. And I, I said it very flippantly earlier like, that I just moved into uh, regional management. It, it, it wasn't just a move. It was uh, many 
unmanagerly tears cried into a pillow at night because you don't know those skills that you need. And dealing with people is very different to dealing with machines. So <laughs> much of that learning that I had, and I spoke to a, a number of other managers that I knew and directors in companies that came from the same kind of space and distilled it into a book of, of five big categories of things that you need to know as a new manager. Wonderful. And uh, so, so tell us the, the name of the book and, uh, uh, and all of that. So the name of the book is This Is Not What I Signed Up For, mm -hmm. and it's a survival guide for first-time managers. Uh, the idea being, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens when you go into management is not what you're signing up for. You, you may think you're going into this wonderful, cushy job because now mm -hmm. it's management. And you realize very, very quickly that, that there's a lot more to it. So we detail things like communications and uh, performance management, how to listen correctly, uh, how to prioritize tasks and do time management, all those kind of things where, where you're now looking after a team instead of just yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And so, folks, you can uh, check that out at, at your convenience there. And uh, I love the uh, scenery. By the way, the scenery brings back uh, uh, a little bit of uh, my memories from uh, my journey from uh, Vietnam back in the early 80s uh, and the o open ocean like that, a small little boat trying to make its way to safety. Uh, you know, the ocean can be very beautiful and it can be very scary, right? Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so uh, wonderful. So so you got into writing books and whatnot. I'm sure there's uh, many more books coming uh, as you uh, continue to evolve and continue to uh, to sharpen uh, that that uh, focus in there, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what was uh, if there was one lesson that you learned from uh, uh, that transition between uh, you know technology or, or being technically focused to be more people focused. Is there a story that you can share that that uh, perhaps kind of uh, you were struggling with and, and maybe the resolution of how it got solved? Um, can you think of a, a story around the uh, a bit of a, a turning point? I think the, the the thing that comes to mind a lot there was it, it it's very difficult to delegate when you have been in charge of some, in charge of something for a long time. So where it's it's pretty much been your baby and you're the sole person responsible for it. And I think when I moved into management, you've got to suddenly learn to hand things off to people and trust people enough and empathize with people enough to let them find a way to to resolve it. And you can't dictate that, oh, you must resolve it this way because that's the way I would do it. And it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a very big learning curve for me in that I'd reached the role because I knew how to do things technically. But the way I do things is not necessarily the way my team would do things. And it ended up getting really bad in that I lost some team members because of the way I was doing things. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a big lesson that it is okay to hand things over. It's okay for people to make mistakes. I mean, people should make mistakes because that's how you learn things. Mm -hmm. So it was a big thing for me to let go of that control a bit and, and, and really let people flourish with me. And I had a very good term that a, a very great leader that I worked with once said, and that's you've got, as a manager, you basically need to make yourself redundant. And the idea is that that's not a bad thing. You wanting your team to be able to take over and you're empowering them to do it. Mm -hmm. And that I think was one of the, the hardest lessons for me to learn is, is, you know, it's not only me that has to do this. I, I have to let people flourish. You bet. Well, thank you for sharing that, uh, that powerful lesson there with us. And it's a common thing that, that, that we all kind of struggle with uh, early on in our management or leadership uh, roles. Uh, I want to bring in some photos and uh, we'll have some fun with these photos. And the first one here is uh, going way back. And uh, uh, I'm just going to bring it right in and uh, have you talk to it here, Ross. Uh, tell us about a, a bit about this. <laughs> so along with being a bit of the geek, I was also the goth kid. Um, so that's that's me on the far right. Um, way back in the day, yeah, I had the dodgy goth nightclubs in town in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's a time of my life I would never take back. And I mean, despite all the spikes and colors and makeup, goths are some of the nicest people you'll meet in your life. And 
part of the testament to that is the lady sitting on the far left there is now my wife um, mm -hmm. and we've been together for, for a number of years now we just actually had our, our anniversary a, a, a week ago wonderful so, congratulations yeah it, it, it's 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 a was a great place great place to be met great friends um but yeah that that was still when i had shorter hair i i, I quite like the longer hair now <laughs> mm -hmm. tell us her name so i can put it on screen for our viewers here bonita b-o-n-i-t-a there we go so again the idea is uh people have many different dimensions to them do not judge somebody just by one picture do not judge somebody just by one aspect of their life uh, we all have many different uh journeys that we take throughout our life and uh you know if you love the uh the way somebody dressed okay if you don't like the way somebody dressed okay uh but 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 don't let that be the final judgment of the end all and be all of that person so so that's a great reminder this yes. photo has for us whether you love this you know you might just be into goth and just just love this awesome great uh, it, but but if you're not this is not your cup of tea that's fine too uh <laughs> but do not do not let that uh, be the end all and be all of your interpretation of who, who the people are yeah. yeah, one of the most accepting groups I've ever met. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Now, uh, I want to just uh, kind of pause here for a moment. And, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the, the, the photos, we're going to run through some photos and we're going to run uh, maybe a video and we're just going to share some multimedia kind of memories and insights. And uh, do uh, tell, continue to tell the stories, uh, Ross. I enjoy that. So, so uh, here you are. What uh, is this later in life? <laughs> <laughs> this was this was during my master's degree. Uh, so one thing about a master's is it's a, there's a lot of trial and error, particularly mm -hmm. in your dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I think round about the third rewrite of my entire dissertation, I got uh, rather tired of of the subject. Uh, it, it had now been about eighteen months of writing in, and we've just scrapped the third draft. Mm -hmm. And I decided I wanted to do something that was completely not technology, completely not uh, innovation, because that's what I was studying was technology and innovation. Uh, so I decided I'm going to go study Swedish massage. And mm -hmm. I, I did a, and, and this is part of the try everything once. I, I did a course and I did my training hours and I, I'm a, a Swedish massage, massage practitioner. Uh, and I'm, I, I think I've got enough hours to work on a ship if I need to. Yeah. But um, with my aversion to the open ocean that you mentioned, I, mm. I probably wouldn't do well on a ship. Mm. But yeah, for, for a while I did massage therapy just in between studying. And then I felt once after that six months had gone, then I jumped back into the studies and completed my, my degree um, within the next year. So quite yeah. a different time. You know, I'm going to share a video here, a fun video from your past. It'll be a bit of a blast from the past. Tell us about this video about you, uh, the car broke down. But but before you do that, let me just uh, get ready here as well. But, but go ahead and tell us the, uh, the preamble and I'll, I'll bring in the photo. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was working for one of the software companies and one of the ladies at the company, uh, her husband used to do a lot of adverts on TV. Mm -hmm. And they, he, he also had long hair, but he was a fairly stocky guy. And she came in saying, like, you know, they, they need someone for an ad. They need them with long hair, but they need to be really slight built. Uh, and I fit the bill with my long hair at the time, and I, mm -hmm. I was pretty slight. So, so the idea was that I could audition for this advert. Uh, and it, it, it turned out to be quite a fun one. I don't think I should give away the rest of it. <laughs> you bet, you bet. I'm going to bring it in here. I believe this Good. is the one right here. So let me bring it in. Let me know if you can hear the, uh, the sound. Okay. Hey, what seems to be the problem? Uh, something's wrong. Yes, dear. Earn your man points, and you could win a kit at our Toyota Hilux. Go to HiluxManUp.co.za. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> let your, is that your, was that your first foray into acting, my friend? <laughs> that was. It was my first foray in front of the camera as well. Um, <laughs> I, I, I never want to have my hair brushed that many times again, ever. So <laughs> I, I think we did in total 93 takes 
for this. Uh -huh. uh, and they had to brush my hair between every take. And I tell you, by the time we got to take 40, I was already really tired of having my hair brushed. <laughs> by the time we got to 93, I couldn't touch my head anymore. It was, it was almost raw. <laughs> But well worth the experience and a, a lot of fun. Uh, the the laughs we've got from this with friends and all of that over the years has just been, it's, it's, it was totally worth it. <laughs> hey, I, I must say you have even longer hair today than you had for that uh, that advertising shoot there. Let's see how long the hair yeah. was here. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> do you? Uh, is is it a little hot in in South Africa with long hair? I guess that's why you kind of bundle it up there, hey? Yes, yeah, so it's very rare that you'll see me with my hair untied. Oh, okay. Um, but with, with our temperatures here, where where I live, we go up to probably about forty five, forty six degrees. Wow. So, and and we don't have the insulation that you you have in in, in Canada or the UK. Hmm. Uh, the temperature inside is pretty much the temperature outside oh, in, in, in a lot of cases, um, particularly in, in townhouses like what I live in. Yeah. So you really get to feel the heat. So I, I, I do generally leave it tied up. And how cold but, does uh, it get? How cold does it get in the winter? Um, where we are now at its absolute coldest, we'd maybe get to about minus three. Hmm. But in general, probably a low of about seven can be expected in winter. Hmm. I see. I yeah. see. Let me bring back uh, the photo here and let us have some more uh, uh, stories told and some fun with uh, the, this journey here. Uh, tell us about this. Sure. Uh, yeah, of course, this is Bernita. That is, that is. This was, this was that, um, wait, wait, when was this? This was just before you and I met. So this was the trip pr prior to that when we went to Vancouver. This was on the Sea to Sky Highway going up towards Whistler. Uh, we we went over. So I was I'd done some work in Vancouver a couple of years prior, and then wanted to bring Bonita over to Canada. And then we we rented a motorcycle in BC, and we did the Duffy Lake Loop, which has got to be one of the most beautiful motorcycle rides I've ever been on. And we took the bike out, and over a period of two days, and if you're doing the full Duffy Lake Loop, I would say do it over a longer period. Uh, we were quite saddle sore at the end of it, but it was the most fantastic views. Now, when this photo was taken, we were standing there getting selfies next to the road, <laughs> and only then noticed this big sign like "Beware of Bears." <laughs> now, we're from Africa, and I think there's this perception that we've got wild animals lie like roaming around. We have none of that. We were so taken aback when we got to Canada and we suddenly there's wild animal warnings. Like, we don't have this in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> you come back and you say, all oh, the wild animal in, in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it was quite a crazy experience that, but uh, what a fantastic ride. I mean, uh, that, that was after that first photo, we lost contact for, for a number of years and we gained contact again on a motorcycle ride. Where I was, I was, I was working as a traffic marshal for um, a motorcycle uh, safety awareness group, mm -hmm. and I was the last bike, and she was the second last bike. And when we got to the venue, and she took her helmet off, I realized it was her, and <laughs> that was our reconnect. Oh wow! Then, what a story! What a story! And uh, that's that's wonderful. And uh, you know, when you think about uh, again. When you get out there and do various activities in your community and do things, you never know who you're going to meet, right? I mean, imagine if, if you just sort of hang around the house and, and didn't really, uh, even, oh, you know, people who, who do and, and get online, some of them meet people online and meet wonderful people online as well. So, so I guess the main point is to reach out and connect, whether it's uh, in person or in some cases even virtual it is better than no connections, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's uh, that's a great photo. And if you remember correctly, uh, that year in Vancouver, I think it uh, it was a bit of a dusting of snow by at the convention center. But w when the you know conference was on, Caps convention was on, a bit of a snowy yeah. kind of day. Not 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 a lot of snow, but a little bit. Ah, there you are. Love the uh, graduation thing there. Your master's in. Yeah, this was the, this was the master's in management of technology and innovation. Wonderful. So that, that was the culmination of all that research. Um, but yeah, what, what a fantastic 
experience to get a degree. Uh, this was when I, I, I wear a tie in, in this photo, and it, it, you would probably have known from seeing me all the time. Ties are so not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, now, I'm guessing you have long hair behind that as well, right? I, I do indeed, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this would have been just before we met as well. Yeah, yeah. So this is you doing your training thing. That's the typical kind of scene, I suppose. Um, I'm very familiar with this scene yeah. that we all are, you know, kind of a group of 20 some people in a kind of corporate training kind of setting. Yeah, so th this was actually the Professional Speakers Association here. This was their midterm convention a number of years back. Mm -hmm. And this this was my first talk that I gave to to the Professional Speakers Association. Right. Which right. was possibly the most nerve wracking talk that I've ever given. It, 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 there's something about presenting to <laughs> peers in the speaking industry that is so much more nerve wracking than speaking to anyone else. Um, <laughs> I wonder if that's the same as, um, you know, so I play music, as you know, and uh, I'm trying to recall when, when I first got in front of fellow musicians and play, did I feel that same way? I think speaking might have a little bit more of that um, dynamic than maybe, uh, you know, musicians, perhaps. Do you think? Uh, perhaps. I, I uh, my I, I played some music back in the day when I was in school, and we did go on stage, and that was a absolute disaster. Um, so <laughs> probably couldn't comment on that too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And of course, later on, you uh, went on to uh, serve the organization, and eventually uh, as a uh, president of the organization there, and uh, now past president, I suppose. Yep. Yep. Immediate past president, right? Immediate now. past president. Yeah. You can kick back ah. and so this is an event that that my wife and I organize. So nice. back before COVID hit, uh, we we haven't done one of these in in well this year at all. Uh, but this is something called Sip Speak, and it was a a little idea we had born from a love of wine and a love of speaking. Mm -hmm. And we this is a, a an active wine shop that allowed us to host events there while the shop was open and active and customers walking in and out. Nice. And we had a little event where we'd get a professional speaker in, got to promote their products, their books, things like this. So this here uh, is Paul Dutois from here from South Africa uh, presenting on, on presentation skills. But it was it's an idea that it was a very quick networking event for business owners that could come in. We took a maximum of 12 people and they could come in meet each other uh, get to speak to a speaker and then also taste a number of boutique fine wines so this shop in particular they don't sell any wines that you'll find in a bulk store or liquor store or anything like that they only sell boutique wines from tiny farms and things like mm -hmm. that so really lovely experience really uh, combining speaking and wine and, and just having a really good fellowship time it, it was great wonderful now uh, you mentioned uh, paul dutois I, I i do recall that he was the one of the speakers at our uh, caps convention in calgary the same convention that you and i met he was one of the speakers and and i i went to uh, uh, the meet the expert at his table there and uh, we had uh, oh. a really good time with him as well in that smaller setting as well yeah, so he, he's one of the main reasons I went through to CAPS because uh, mm -hmm. he was speaking about his experience at CAPS and how much he enjoyed it mm -hmm. uh, at the convention. And that was one of my um, decision points for saying, yeah, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, interesting how it all ties up. Mm -hmm. It's all about people. It's all about people. Yeah. And... So th this was an interesting photo. Uh, this was, uh, I, I was lecturing for a, a period of about three years. And th this was probably the most entertaining lecture I had to do. Uh, and it doesn't look like much from the photo here, but you'll see the tables are actually round tables mm -hmm. and it was combined with these office chairs. This was actually the canteen at one of the biggest banks here. Uh, we had uh, two day lectures at a time and the second day that we arrived for this lecture, the CEO of the bank had booked out uh, all the boardrooms for some private training that he had to do. 
So we had no boardroom left for the training <laughs> that we had to give to about 40 students and <laughs> ended up commandeering uh, one of the cafeterias, blocking it off with a couple of like hazard tape mm -hmm. and then trying to rearrange cafeteria table. We presented, we set up a TV screen next to the kettle and, and that was our, our, our display that we were using. And then we didn't have a whiteboard. So we just had these big pages that everyone would hold up and, and run around with. And it was a hugely entertaining lecture, but I think that that was one of the things where you learn that you have to expect the unexpected when you're, when you're speaking, because man, can that unexpected come at the drop of a hat. Yeah. So, so with all that much fun that you had, you, you could coin the phrase, uh, we were laughing all the way at the bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rather than laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, well, wonderful. You know, uh, it, it's, um, again, community, right? You plug into your community and and you make use of whether it's wine store, whether it's uh, the bank or whatever have you. Again, that sense of uh, uh, work and interaction within the community. Yeah. Cool. And, of course, there's R&R &R here. Oh, th this was actually work, but it was the <laughs> greatest kind of work. So this was my first international speaking gig. Um, and, and this was in uh, Mauritius, which was a fantastic place to start having an international gig. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a, a two-day conference. I was speaking on uh, privacy risk. And this was, the, this was directly out of the boardroom as to what we were looking out on, onto the ocean for. And it, it, was, it was two days of this, great weather. This was the most overcast that it was. The rest of the time was beautifully sunny, yeah. but fantastic place to have your first talk. And, and being close to the time zone here, a number of people didn't know I was actually there because I, I was still working in corporate. I arranged to work from home for a couple of days. And I actually ended up working from a coffee shop when I wasn't presenting on stage and, and no one was any the wiser that I was actually out the country. But that again <laughs> speaks to I think the how virtual the world is right now where you can do that. And I've been a proponent for remote work for, for years. And uh, I think what we've seen this year is that it's just, it is perfectly possible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> certainly has its advantages for sure. And uh, as yeah. well as this, uh, unique challenges that we have to overcome as well. So uh, there's one of your lovelies. Yeah, this is this is our daughter. This is Cleo. Uh, I'm uh -huh. surprised there hasn't been a bark or two yet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she's our little Italian greyhound cross whippet and, and she rules the house. So mm. this is this is on the main bed and this is her bed. I think we simply rent some space from her. Um, amazing little character. Yeah, cool. That's yeah, the other one. Yeah, this, this is this is my office mate. Uh, I, she's probably going to be knocking at the door at some point too. Um, so she, I, I call her my assistant in the office, and, and she's she's been present on many meetings and in many boardrooms. And a, a number of my clients actually ask about her <laughs> when she's not in the meeting. But you should give them again, you should give them titles, titles and roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she she's actually attacked me in mid meeting because I tried to move her off my lap and she didn't want to go. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up with this cat clawing at me on the side of the screen Ouch. while I was trying to give a presentation. <laughs> oh, I recognize these people. <laughs> yeah, this was our first meeting. You were you were I think the first person to greet me in the hall when I arrived. So it was yeah. a fantastic meeting. Yeah, this was at uh, the registration desk, uh, uh, an evening or two. This is uh, the evening before the pre-convention. That's how hardcore we are. We come the evening before the pre-convention day. <laughs> I, I think you can actually still see in this how jet lagged I was. Though, yeah. I, I was, I think, only 12 hours off the plane at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was great to have met you. and. Uh, uh, I'm glad you uh, you enjoyed Vancouver and enjoyed Canada. And uh, uh, let's uh, look at uh, some more photos here. Yeah. So th this is a, a bit of a this is one of our, our things that we do is we we do trail runs. I, I love trail runs, and I mean we've got so much fantastic nature here to go out and run in, and and also our temperatures and climate is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So this is this is at one of the trails we go to. It's about probably five kilometers from our house, mm -hmm. and yeah. 
bad idea taking a photo looking directly into the sun, but uh, it's one of my favorites of Cleo, our, our little pup. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is with the best friends out running. And the, the, I mean, we were out this morning. We did a, a three kilometer trail run just before we started the day. So fantastic thing to do. And it, it, it's where we get our, a lot of our exercise in. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious uh, with your uh, limited uh, kind of uh, exposure to Canada so far and the fact that you guys enjoyed it quite a bit uh, each time you were here. Um, I was wondering if you have uh, kind of noticed what was similar in Canada as it is in uh, South Africa, where, you know, it's like really the same. And then if you could also talk about what is quite different between South Africa and Canada in the your perceived early kind of uh, impression of Canada. Um, so I, I think that the big thing that hits out straight away is how friendly Canadians are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, we the, South Africa's got a checkered past. We, we can't deny that. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot to get through and there's a lot of distrust here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can say a story the, the first time I was in Vancouver it was the first evening I, I'd ever been in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I had arrived, I checked into the hotel. Uh, I was staying on Granville Street, which in hindsight is not somewhere I'd stay again. It was a little bit loud until four in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, decided to just pop out, get a little bit of supper and a drink maybe, and uh, went to a bar and sat down, ordered some food, or sitting at the bar. And someone just greeted me, asked me where my accent was from. And when I said South Africa, they're like, oh, we've got to go for a wine tasting. And they paid my bill and dragged me off to a tasting up the road. Mm -hmm. So th that was just the craziest thing. That's not <laughs> something you see here, which was great. But I mean, I think there's a lot of similarities as well. I, I yeah. expected much colder. Mm -hmm. And like the likes of Vancouver reminds me of Cape Town over mm -hmm. here. And I found out since that they're basically sister cities when it comes to climate. Um, mm -hmm. Vancouver just gets a little more snow. Ah, so, cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, now, I, I was just uh, sort of wondering uh, forward here, but I'm going to go back to where we were there. And uh, yeah. let's continue, my friend. Tell us about this next. Um, you, you know, in an upside down world, Ross decided to just <laughs> go with it. How how about we go something like that? <laughs> so so our doormat at our front door says, welcome to the upside down. And that that's a, a, a double meaning there one because we really enjoyed the show stranger things mm -hmm. and two because my wife and i do aerial arts so mm -hmm. uh, we both started out doing pole fitness so not not quite pole dancing or exotic pole dancing we we, we did pole fitness and one of the things with folks that do a lot of pole fitness is every time you see a street pole this is basically what you do. It, it kind of becomes a thing. This is why you see on some of the uh, train cars, they say, like, you know, please don't use the poles to do pole dance. Uh, Those signs are but, yeah. put up after at least one person have done something that they don't want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this was a stop street in northern uh, Mauritius. Uh, so so that tell same me, conference. I, I got to ask, have you ever slipped and, and kind of found um, that gravity was against you? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you get something. So now I do hoop, but you get pole kisses and hoop kisses because you're on this solid steel bar. You're bound to bruise yourself somewhere. So mm -hmm. the, the bruises you affectionately get to know as kisses. But yeah, you, I, I've I've damaged my ankle where I couldn't walk for about six weeks properly. Um, mm -hmm. I've hit, the the floor is always there to catch you, but sometimes <laughs> when it does, it's a hard catch. <laughs> yeah. But as they say, you got to have fun in life. You, you can't just avoid all of the risk, right? I mean, uh, yeah. getting on. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting onto this uh, call, there's some risk. Driving down the street, there's some risk. Walking outside, there's some risk. Uh, life is yeah. full of risk. We just have to decide uh, how we want to live life, right? Yeah, and it, it, it's amazing the strength you gain from working against your own body weight, which is just, it's an amazing sport um, mm. to do. But cool. I mean, I've, I've since gone into hoops, which is my absolute passion. There you are. <laughs> yeah. So th this here was the first time I ever used a hoop. Um, mm. so th this was set up in a park uh, in Johannesburg, and you could go and play if you wanted to. So I went and played on this, and this was like, this was an absolute love affair with the hoop, or they also call it Lyra. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, I love this. this. This is what I'm doing to this day now. This has been a number of years I've been doing it. I'm just going to throw it in just for fun. Some people who work with you and is this uh, corporate uh, information security <laughs> kind of guy and do threat detection and the, you know, whatever, all of these things. And, and then, of course, um, when you get out from work, you get into, uh, you know, hoops and the uh, uh, pole gravity yeah. defying things. Uh, like you said, <laughs> like you said, you're, you're, you're squeezing the juice out of life. You, you are kind of, uh, again, uh, live life the, on your own terms in your own ways. There's not any mold that you have to fit. It sounds like. Yeah, I, I think that's a, there's a big thing to not trying to fit into a mold. I think, I think you need to, I've said it before, you need to own your weird. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's something I, I say to a, a number of people because there is, and it's the reason I don't wear a suit and tie anymore. If I'm in a suit and tie, people take me less seriously than if I'm in a t-shirt with a jacket. I mean, I, I normally would wear a sports jacket and a t-shirt. That's the style you probably know me with. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't want to wear a jacket in 33 degrees tonight. <laughs> but it, if I go, I mean, my, my signature really in the corporate space is funky t-shirts. Um, I mean, this is like from Hot Topic. And mm -hmm. People know me in corporate for that. And I, I've had it before where people, where I've worn a tie and they say, no, they can't take me seriously because it, it doesn't look like it reflects my profession. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at my laptop, my laptop is covered in stickers and things like that. <laughs> and I, it's, it's what I do. Yeah. And the second I made that decision almost that this is me, this is what I do, it made it so much easier even in corporate because now people expect that they know me, they know my quirks and, and it, it works wonderfully. You also stand out when they look at a room full of people <laughs> wearing suits. Uh, and here you are with this colorful and beautiful, uh, in some cases, uh, maybe uh, meaningful messages on there as well. Uh, you're going to stand out. Uh, you do stand out, right? Yeah. And, and the, you also got the, the hair to boot, the now, hair, you know, the hair. The <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, what you can say is you have the locks. <laughs> We don't mean security <laughs> locks. We mean <laughs> we're gonna lock you up. <laughs> okay, I better stop there. Let's uh, go on to the next. One. There you are. Uh, yeah. Now, is this at a park somewhere? It looks like it. Is this at a park or maybe playground? Yeah, this is at a park again. So mm -hmm. um, this was that same. This is about a year later, I think, from the previous photo uh, where. We went to the same park, did the same event, but now I'd done a few classes and things like that. So I was getting a little better at it at, at this point. But yeah, so much fun, so much fun. Mm -hmm. we, we do work in a studio. I think the, the one of the photos that, that you've got is, is from a studio. Um, yeah, this one here. So this, this is the studio that I train at um, mm -hmm. in Pretoria. And yeah, nice high ceilings. So the ceilings, I think, are three and a half meters in the air. And then you you swing from the rafters basically, and, and yeah. get fit at the same time. Yeah, that's about ten feet. Yeah, uh, yeah. for us who might be still thinking feet, but uh, that's awesome, my friend. That's awesome. So uh, your wife is into it. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the work that your wife do do that is very much uh, up the alley from here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, this, <laughs> we love it so much that we've got it set up at home as well. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> My wife's got a background in, in design, but one of the things that's sort of comes through, particularly like even now, and we'll speak to, I'll speak to that in a bit, is she, she's also a fitness instructor. So she has a Pilates studio and she also, she, like I do aerial hoops, she does uh, aerial silks and aerial hammocks, which is the, a lot more of the silky side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and with her Pilates, she's been doing fitness for, for a number of years now, and she's now got her own studio here. And with lockdown kicking in, I think there's a, the last picture I sent you as well, mm -hmm. is the second lockdown hit here and Corona hit, she took that online. Mm -hmm. And she now has a, a larger online studio than she did in person. Mm -hmm. And she's now, again, because of this online stuff, I mean, she's teaching Pilates to folks in Australia. She's pe teaching Pilates to folks here in South Africa, across the country. Uh, I think there's been interest from the UK. And the time zones work well, because if we're, she's doing a, a late afternoon class here, it's a morning class for, for Canada. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's sort of the space she's gone into. So she, her studios do Pilates, and, and mm -hmm. she's been teaching virtually now. And it's been fantastic. 
Again, you know, what you focus on and what you nurture grows. And here we are talking about some plants. Is that tomato or? That's chili. So that one of my, my hobbies is nice. growing uh, hot peppers. Mm -hmm. And I, I think at the high, highest point, I had 18 different types of chili pepper growing. Mm. Um, now, mm. now we're down to about six of the favorites. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But let's, uh, I'm just going to kind of enlarge it for viewers here. That's, uh, so does it grow year round or do you have a few months where you can do this? No, it, it, it's seasonal. So, uh, we, we've had a particularly warm winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of my plants actually survived, but generally it's just one season. Mm -hmm. But around September, October, I plant, and then through sort of November through March, can harvest. Mm -hmm. So nice. Uh, get a lot of chilies out of that. That almost looks like tomato there to me. <laughs> almost, but a little warmer. <laughs> yeah, no, a little warmer. <laughs> these these yeah. are called cherry bombs. Oh, okay. Cherry bomb. Very yeah. cool. Very small, very sweet, and a bit warm. Uh-huh. Yeah, that that was something we picked up in Ontario. That's an Ontario hot sauce. Oh that's yeah. So that's good. your uh, uh what is it? Uh Canadian uh, kind of memorabilia kind of what's the word uh memento. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we brought it back for a friend of ours. There's a there's a show that I love watching on YouTube called Hot Ones. Mm. And this is one of the sources that they use on that show. So I brought it back for a friend of ours <laughs> and, and we shared it. <laughs> and I, I I haven't had many things hotter than this, but mm. the flavor is fantastic. Mm. So we, we we practically emptied the bottle between my wife, my friend, and myself in in, in an evening. It was but like a, a bottle of wine. It sounds like you had you, you treat it like just like a bottle of wine. You uncorked it and <laughs> you just uh, finished it right there. Actually, <laughs> shared with friends. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So so you do the, some baking and cooking as well, hey? Yeah, that's my de-stress. Uh, the more courses we have in the house, you, the more stressed I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you do uh, a lot of work uh, from home, obviously, uh, mostly remotely now, and, and you do some training and sessions and whatnot there as well. You do some consulting, yeah. uh, uh, a lot of consulting these days right now, I hear. But uh, there yeah, it is yeah. with some of your harvests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So most, most of that was uh, grown here at home, except for the fish underneath. But mm -hmm. um that, that's making some good chili uh, hake with lemon. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely a de-stress for me, definitely a, a, a hobby, but that's also a bit of a passion. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, that great. Are you a Trekkie? I am, and that is signed by William Shatner himself. So oh. I had the, the pleasure of meeting him at Comic-Con here in South Africa mm -hmm. last year and managed to get him to sign my Star Trek V DVD. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I, another guest was on uh, a few days ago, and, and he's the one that uh, collaborate with, uh, with um, William Shatner on, uh, you know, a bit of a tour. Uh, so um, he talks about how, uh, you know, William Shatner, he's like uh, in his 90s, right? And he's yeah. still very active, working on a major project. Uh, like I, I just, uh, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, he just released a blues album. So. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can't fathom that. You know, to be in your mids to late nineties or whatever that age is now, and, and still be involved in so many big and, and significant projects like that. Uh, the guy's not. Yeah, winding down and no, it was, it was amazing to see him and meet him. Mm, nice. Uh, this is more of the geekery. So this is the Orpheum <laughs> Theater in Vancouver. Oh, um, but this is the the scene. It's it's a scene from Battlestar Galactica. Uh, this is the Temple of Five in Battlestar Galactica. Oh, so when we found that out, we had to go here and get photos and things <laughs> like that. I, I love everything Battlestar. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. And this is uh, Bonita, your wife, with her. Uh, Workshops that she does. She she probably does it. Uh, is it almost almost daily or or how often uh, does she? Do? More than once a day. More so, than once a day. Yeah, some days there's uh, I think up to three classes in a day. So wow. she'll get three hours of Pilates in uh, on a day. Wow. Um, as well as all the other activities that we do. Yeah, that's that's great. You know, again, a reminder for all of us that during difficult times like COVID and during the lockdown. 
Uh, there are things that are more relevant now than before. I mean, this whole, imagine if a year ago she was like, I wanted to take my classes virtual. I wanted to, you know, kind of teach you to people all over the world engaging. That would have been a harder journey. And all of a sudden Absolutely. COVID, COVID just changed reality. And in the new reality, things that used to be hard is now easy. Things that not used yeah. to be, you know, very interested to, to, by people, people are not into it. All of a sudden people are uh, all over it. So, so, you know, anytime where there's a major change, really look for, you know, how to engage with that new reality. We, we just, where we're at right now, right? Yeah, uh, we had a, a tremendous benefit in, you know, I've been working remotely um, on and off, even when I was still in corporate. So the last seven years I've been working remotely, it's, it's second nature for me. Uh, and, and Bonita as well has been working remotely for the last six, seven years. So we, we were already, I think, in that space mm -hmm. and that mindset so that when lockdown happened, there was no, you didn't skip a beat. You were just like, okay, we're online now. And that's kind of how it happened. And I think with her and her business, she, she basically cornered the market because she was the only one doing this. Everyone else was waiting to see what would happen, <laughs> but she do dove in and now people are still trying to figure out, okay, how do we do these classes online? And she's already got it down. All the equipment, everything's already in place. As has been said by many people that went before us, you know, luck favored the prepared mind. So, so if we are prepared, when opportunity comes knocking, we answer the door. We, we don't try to shoo it away. We don't try to kind of run into the basement or, or another room. We open the door when an opportunity knocks, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. That's a wonderful story. And, uh, I see uh, Janet. Uh, Janet, uh, thank you for uh, chiming in here. She says 100% in agreement with what you said earlier. So uh, you, you can, uh, Thanks, yeah, you can uh, know that it translates well. So, so of course, Janet is uh, in Canada here. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that are universal, whether it's you're in South Africa or Canada or whatever have you. Uh, so, yeah. so um, thank you for sharing that and, and say hi to Bonita for me as well. I know she enjoyed Canada with her visits here as well. So that's good. I will do. There's your book. And that's the common wow. scene that I see of all my author friends. Uh, you know, it's a very, you know, I'll get there. I'm writing a book right now. So, so I'll get there to this oh, photo. Uh, but um, tell us about that, the experience of having your book in a box and you open it. <laughs> Oh, I, that was just something else. The culmination of all this work and then you arrive and you unpack it. It's just, it, it's the most amazing feeling out there because, you know, it's, it's, I think through the editing process, you actually get so tired because you're reading the same things over and over. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's such a relief when you get to this point and it, it actually arrives. Um, so this was phenomenal. Uh, uh, such an experience getting this. Um, this set of crates that arrive on the back of a truck and then you open them up and this is what's inside. It was, mm -hmm. it was really something else. It's something else to be holding your book and it, knowing it's not the proof anymore. This is the actual book. And it, it, I mean, it's a real rewarding experience. Uh, would you agree that it's, it's better than a, a, pa a pallet of toys? <laughs> <laughs> your, yeah. Your, your favorite so technical toys arriving on a pallet. Uh, that's not the same excitement as your own books that you have sort of no, sweat this, in. This, this was something else. This is this is a milestone event. Mm, great. great. Um, well, looking forward to uh, more books from you, my friend, and uh, do continue yeah. that journey. And as you uh, do more and more speaking and more and more training, there will also be more uh, uh, things that you're going to kind of um, include in your next uh, several books as well. Uh, and, of course, you yeah. know, your whole... Uh, uh, artistic side, whether it's uh, uh, gravity defying, uh, what are those hoops and uh, uh, trapeze and all those things there? <laughs> well, trapeze I might try next year. Apparently, that's coming to our studio, so I, I may actually try that next year. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So there's your kind of corporate look with the t-shirt in the back there. You got a jeans there. You got just a little bit, just enough of corporate uh, kind of thing there. Yeah, that's about as formal as I get uh, <laughs> when it comes to corporate. Um, yeah. 
Well, I, I have had people tell me at black tie events that I should dress like this at a black tie event, but uh -huh. I, I can't get myself quite to that yet. Uh, okay. um, I'll still do the black tie. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can do a black tie on a white t-shirt. Would you be able to pull that off? <laughs> well, someone told me to get like a bow tie and everything printed on a t-shirt and then wear that. Oh, but I, 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 I do like a three-piece suit or a dinner suit, so yeah. I, I, it'll take me a while to get away from that. <laughs> Hey, is that a test tube or? Yeah, that's Dexter's lab. It's a fine day for science. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for sharing these uh, photos and the stories that that, that come with them, uh, Ross. Uh, I want to ask Absolutely. you a few questions, and I, I have some videos to show as well. Uh, one of the videos that I have is, uh, let me just pull it up here and, uh, and just kind of come back to that, it is um, the... Uh, the virtual show reel. Tell us about that. It, it obviously uh, took some work to put that together. Uh, I'll bring it in here as you introduce it. Yeah. So, I mean, this was again as lockdown hit. Uh, I, m the majority of my presentations up until lockdown was in the corporate boardroom and, and behind closed doors. Uh, so, the virtual side was to just get people to see that that we were able to do it. And one of the things. As soon as we started seeing what was happening, I mean, just before lockdown hit in South Africa, it was the uh, Plan B summit in Namibia with a lot of our speaker friends globally there. And seeing what was happening in Europe with a lot of lockdowns happening and people not being able to get equipment and things like that, I jumped in as soon as like. information inside your email. I guarantee you if I go and search in your sent items, I will find your passport number, your ID number, social security number, anything like that because we use email to apply for a lot of things. You really don't want to be jumping into the SDLC with guns blazing because what happens then is you end up developing features that use people's information without actually checking with them and whether you've got any legitimate basis of doing so. Basically identical. GDPR is the evolution of these principles into a new data privacy law that accounts for things like the cloud and the way we are computing nowadays. This is a phishing tactic that a lot of guys use. And what happens now is the email address and the password of that user that filled in that information is now sitting with the hackers. If you are developing software and you're hosting your software and client data in the cloud in something like AWS or Azure, you've got to be careful that you are not crossing borders. Crossing borders means you've got to take additional precautions and check that the border you're crossing and the data protection laws on the other side of it are strong enough to be keeping that data in line with your privacy laws. Wonderful. So uh, tell us a bit more about that. Uh... <laughs> so th this was really, um, you know, going into lockdown and, and, and trying to show what, what could be done, because I think people have been pretty averse to remote presenting and stuff like that previously. Like, we want you here in person. But there are so many ways you can give the presentation. You can still be standing. You can be seated. You can still be picture in picture. You can be uh, there. There are so many possibilities of how to present. And I, I think we've come a long way now uh, in the last seven months, just looking at different speakers and, and, and how everyone has come into this. But back when it was just starting, I think there was such an education component to 
showing people that you can present. And I think that's what I wanted to bring across in this, that you know we can still do your data privacy training. We can do it online. There's no reason to stop. And I mean, what, what turned out from all of this COVID stuff is that there were, was actually an increase in attacks and cybersecurity issues during the lockdowns. Um, it, it, it's the highest attack rates we've seen because everyone's working from home now. So uh, I think it was a lot of education, like this is what we can do for you online. And 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 throwing in some of those things that that's perhaps not so obvious that it is better. You can reach broader audiences. You can address everyone in their home now instead of trying to get a whole bunch of people in a boardroom at, at the same time. It, it works well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you for uh, sharing that. And uh, uh, let me ask you this question, and then I have a couple of other things for you. But uh, when I reach out to uh, Ross and says, you know, uh, let's chat for an hour and a bit, and uh, we can chat about uh, a few different things and kind of your choice as to where you want to focus. Was there area that you wanted to uh, share that we haven't gotten to yet, my friend? Um, I, I think we've covered everything. I think I... I, I, I wove some of the stuff in earlier as we were discussing. So I, I don't know if there's any additional points, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've been thoroughly enjoying this. I don't know if there's anything else you want to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you a few questions then. So uh, do you think that uh, part of you will always uh, enjoy the technical side of things? Uh, you know, uh, as some people say, once a geek, always a geek. I, I find myself that way in the sense of, uh, mm -hmm. yes, we get into management consulting. Yes, we get into leadership development. And yes, we love the people side of it. And, and yes, we just, just thrive on it. Uh, but but uh, when need be, and we get pulled back into the technology for whatever reason, uh, for example, I find that during COVID here, um, Having a background in technology has been very helpful because whether it's mm. this kind of a thing that we're doing, whether it's uh, uh, just doing the remote training that we do, all of these different things, uh, the, the need for technology and doing our work, whatever it is, has just increased with COVID here. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I have that technology background. Uh, do you feel the same way? Do you have a, a geek that will always be inside you when it comes, you know, when it comes to uh, technology? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when I went into management, um, like I said, I, I moved into management while I was still with my peers in, in work. And one of the guys that was in my team uh, made a bit of a, a Dilbert joke saying that, you know, I've drunk from the cup of management. I'm going to lose the knack. <laughs> and it's, you know, you do do a lot of stuff in management. And you maybe don't get as involved in the technical side anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I will, I think, most certainly always be a geek while we're talking here in my credenza next to me is an entire bag of microcontrollers and you talk about soldering and, and things like that that's what I do as a hobby too like I, I build home automation so my house runs and Siri runs my house practically um, mm -hmm. and that that's the geek side of me and part of the presentations I give with the speakers association is also the tech of speaking uh, what mm -hmm. what can you do what can't you do what should you do what should you be looking out for things like that Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think there'll always be a geeky, geeky streak in me. Yeah. Um, and the cybersecurity side, I'll, I'll, I think I'll always be flexing that because you have to stay current. You bet. And again, cyber is not going to go away anytime no. soon. Uh, security yeah. is not going to go away anytime soon. So, so you're, you're good for a while, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope so. Uh, you'll evolve as you stay, you know, you have to uh, keep update yourself and, and, and things like that. You'll evolve just like any other field and, and particularly when it comes to cyber and security. Those are fast moving fields and, and uh, very so, uh, fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what was uh, thought of yesterday is now old news and, and all of a sudden there's new ways that, uh, you know, people are very uh, creative and, uh, you know, thankfully good people are creative, but, but bad people are also creative. <laughs> <laughs> that they are, that they are. We, we see so many different interesting attacks that happen and how things get taken advantage of. I mean, we, we just had a phenomenal breach here in South Africa where 24 million South Africans records have gone missing. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't because of hacking, it was because of social engineering someone mm. pretended to be someone they weren't mm. and managed to convince someone to give them the information and then they ran Which off with is it and the, a great reminder that that human beings is among the weakest link in the whole security yeah. chain isn't it <laughs> yeah absolutely and that's where education and awareness comes in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and, and eventually you want to create that culture that 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 just way of being that that that's just second nature that's the key thing is culture that's one of the biggest things i train on one of the if you have that culture of privacy and security in a business mm -hmm. it it self regulates itself mm. where instead of having to wait for the information officer to hear that something's gone wrong you have a team member that just says oh you shouldn't have done that or don't do that let's do it this way mm -hmm. and it, it it resolves things throughout the business before anything goes wrong even mm -hmm. As they say, uh, I think it was Peter Drucker who, who said, you know, uh, culture will eat uh, strategy for breakfast every day of the week. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, certainly culture will eat tactics as well, because you can have all these tactics put in place to try and manage your security. But if you have a culture of um, really opposing that or, or really negating that, then you're just going to be swimming upstream to this whole security mess, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And you, or you end up with the worst situation where people don't report incidents because they out of fear of being uh, judged or punished or something like that. And that's the mm -hmm. worst kind of culture to have for it as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell us, my friend, uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, were you born and raised in South Africa? Yes, yes, I was. Born, born and bred in Benoni, so the same town as Charlize Theron. Mm. So that, that, that's <laughs> my international <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to have you uh, wrap it up i'm going to have you kind of take us home here on this uh, conversation but before we do that let me just say thanks to our viewers who are watching live as well as those who are watching later in the recorded uh, replay of this video thank you folks for uh, tuning in and thank you for uh, sharing your time with us here with Ross and, and, and myself uh, on this uh, wonderful day and later on in the replay. Uh, take good care of yourself, folks. Take good care of one another and uh, be kind and, uh, you know, be part of the solution. Be part of the solution. So, Ross, for taking us out, you have complete freedom, my friend. You can, uh, uh, if you want to do a trapeze act, you can. If you want to sing a song, you can. <laughs> if you want to play guitar, feel free. Uh, take as long as you want. Take as short as you want. But um, I'll leave it to you to take us out, my friend. Thank you so much for spending time with us here today. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been fantastic. Uh, I, I think I'm going to go the short and sweet route. And also, my ceiling's not high enough here for me to do anything on the hoop. But uh, I think the big thing that I, I just want to say, and it, it ties into that theme that, that we've spoken about, is it's really you only have one life to live. And I think it, it's really important that you you grab it and you try new things and and like i said own your weird do something that you don't know whether you'll enjoy or not because chances are you might love it and i think throughout my life trying different things moving through different spaces moving through different career spaces has just been the most amazing journey and uh, I, I have no idea where it's going to going to be stopping for me i have no intention of it stopping and i i hope that other people can enjoy things as, as much as I have in life. And, and please grab it, grab it and enjoy it. You only have one to live. Mm -hmm. May I make a request? You may. <laughs> Could we see your hair? <laughs> there you go. How long is it? Wait, have you measured it? We can um, I haven't measured it, but it started getting stuck in my belt now. Oh, so. wow. It's probably time for a trim. But. Uh, see, that's that's awesome. That's now those are some locks there, my friend. There you go. <laughs> very messy. <laughs> All you need is an electric guitar, and you can just hit that stage very convincingly right now, my friend. <laughs> well, is, I've got an electric guitar in the other room. Oh, there uh, you I go. Just haven't played it in <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Russ, and. Uh, um, Hang, hang in uh, around in the green room for a minute or so. I'll give you a high five in there. But uh, folks, uh, again, thank you so much and have a wonderful day, folks. Thanks, Ross. Thank you.